Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over the UFC card for uh, Saturday, October 15th. I'm glad I kind of waited on this because there was a 12th fight uh, whose salary was kind of delayed and being put up on the on the board. And uh, so now I'm going to be able to deal with all that. Now, as I finish this, uh, this preview, I'm fairly certain that we're going to have a fight canceled. That's just the way my luck has been with respect to uh, my timing of releasing this stuff. But I'm actually going to be away uh, for the weekend, so I want to make sure to get this up. Uh, if there's um, any change, I will try to come on here and do an update, but it will be difficult. Uh, nonetheless, it is a 12-fight card, which is, I guess, on the small side. I mean, we've had lower, we've had higher. And as far as potential scoring, I think it's probably, I would say, on the average side. Um, not particularly high scoring, not particularly low scoring. So we're going to approach this as we would your, your average type of slate, meaning that we're looking for fighters with significant upside. We are not going to be content with just taking the W and taking six for six wins. Uh, even with underdogs, we're going to attempt to, to prioritize those underdogs that, you know, that have good high scoring upside. Um, if it were a much smaller slate, I'd be kind of content to get six for six. If it was a much bigger slate, I would be even more uh, greedy about the type of upside I'd be wanting for my fighters. So I think that overall, I think that we are going to be moderately greedy with our underdogs, moderately greedy with our favorites and things like that. Um, the other thing, just to kind of shake it up, I am going to go from the, uh, from the top down this particular time, uh, just for no reason, just to shake it up. And we're going to actually start with the main event. I guess one of the reasons we're starting with the main event is let's let's look at it actually in the context of the slate for a set for a second. So we're looking at the the various big favorites over nine k. You know, you have Grasso, Tyra, Askarov, uh, Henry, Brito, Rodriguez. I think of all of these fighters, I, I think that uh, Grasso is the one I have probably the least amount of interest in, and, and normally when it comes to the main event, the main event is usually a fight that mathematically is going to be, you know, uh, very strong because you have five rounds to work with. But in this particular case, uh, the style of this matchup is such that I don't see Grasso being able to put up the, you know, enough, enough DraftKings points to justify her 9k price tag. Um, all of the metrics are just kind of uh, against her here. The fight doesn't go to decision line. It's, 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 two to one to, to go to decision, which is really poor for a nine K um, Grasso herself to win by, by uh, TKO is a plus three eighty, And by submission is plus six fifty. inside the distance is plus two fifty, Um, And that is over five rounds, you know, it, it's so even if you would think that plus two fifty is a good, good inside the distance prop for nine K, which it isn't, it still, you know, doesn't change the fact that if you get the fourth or fifth round uh, uh, stop, it just might not be good enough. Uh, and the other problem with with Grasso here is she doesn't have that uh, grappling upside to overcome a lack of a good inside the distance prop. So the five rounds definitely helps her because she is higher volume than than Araujo. Than Araujo. But I just think at her price tag, I think she's going to be the clearest fade of all of the um, the 9K and up fighters. Um, so I'm probably not going to play her much, if at all. The other side of this fight is somewhat interesting, uh, Arahu. She is, um, she's priced efficiently. Um, her, her, let's, let's get to this. Let's, let's actually sort by fight number again. She's 7,200, which is commensurate with kind of a plus 200, um, a plus 200 underdog. So you're not getting a lot of value there. Um, What's interesting, though, is she does have some takedown upside. Um, and, and for someone that has takedown upside, the, the, the five rounds is something that can help her. Now, the thing that's kind of that's going to depress her ownership a little bit is, is a narrative, which I've, I don't know what I'm going to call it a narrative. It's, it's an observation that a lot of MMA experts have, have come up with over the last you know, week of, of content, that Arahu is not particularly suited for a, a five-round fight. Um, yeah, people have commented that in the third round, she's gotten gassed out a little bit. And, and I, I take issue with that type of analysis in general. 
um, for this reason, you know, if, if you're a fighter and you have or been told that it's a three round fight, you're going to train for a three round fight. You're going to plan for a three round fight. And in a perfect world, you're going to expend your energy um, efficiently to account for the possibility of it going three rounds. And that's it. You know, you're, you're not you're not planning. It's kind of like inventory control. You know what I mean? Like if, if, if you if you have too much inventory, that's not behaving efficiently either. You know what you're supposed to do. Forget inventory for a second. If you're planning for a fight, it should be that you expend all of your energy as late as possible. In other words, at the end of the fight, you should have literally nothing else left to give. Okay. Otherwise, you pro especially if you lost, you you haven't behaved efficiently, right? You did not use your cardio appropriately if you are just completely fresh at the end of the fight, and especially if you lost. Um, so I, I'm of the belief that unless there's extreme evidence to the contrary that you can't fight five rounds, I'm going to presume that in a five round fight, a reasonable trainer and a reasonable fighter is going to just, you know, pace herself more appropriately. Um, and as such, I do think that she is a pretty live underdog, you know, you know, given her, listen, she's two to one, so it's not great. Okay. So she's only going to win 33% of the time, but I do feel as though, her path to victory, including ups, including takedowns, if I'm right about the cardio and that she can make it through five rounds, we, we talk about having five rounds to work with with respect to a striker. But if your path to victory in some form depends on takedowns, imagine having five rounds to work with with respect to takedowns. You know, if all you need, and this is this is what I've noticed, is if you can find one kind of entree, like one takedown approach that works against a particular fighter, they're not going to be able to fix it right on the spot. And you can go right back to that, like for the, the entirety of the fight. I mean, I've seen, especially women fighters, I've seen, well, actually, especially women fighters, one woman fighter I saw found that all she had to do was take this one headlock trip takedown of someone. And, and she just had no answer for it. And she just kept doing it. And she was about a, five to one favorite and she won kind of going away. Um, and so I do think that the five rounds is going to help Araujo. Um, is it going to help her more than Grasso? I, I really think so. Um, is it going to help her more? It's kind of an interesting question, but, but nonetheless, I do think that Araujo is the preferred side here in this fight from a DFS perspective. And I, I will get to some of her. Um. Okay, Cub Swanson against Jonathan Martinez. You have, let's look at, first of all, the, the pricing here. You have about a two to one. So the, the pricing should be somewhat similar to that first fight. And you actually are getting, I guess, a little bit of relative value on Martinez. Um, Martinez is only 8,800. And he's being priced, nah, actually, it's about the same. So he's about, th th there's no real difference between the Grasso fight and the Martinez fight with respect to equity pricing. Let's take a look, though, at the inside the distance props here. You have pretty poor fight. You know, pretty poor. Pretty poor fight doesn't go to decision line of minus 135 goes to decision. Um, and even when you break that down by fighter, you have, you, what do you have? Swanson inside the distance plus 400. And Martinez, Martinez inside the distance is what? He is plus 200 okay that's that's okay right martinez has said this is plus 209k it's not great though remember we i just talked about that with respect to uh to grasso up there um so plus 200 at 9k is not great but plus 200 8800 maybe a little bit better so um i think that actually martinez given the way ownership is probably going to spread out this week I think that Martinez could be a good low owned play. Um, one of the benefits of you having me do this video after absorbing some content is I get to hear like a lot of the takes of all of the, you know, all the content providers that people follow. And I've heard a lot of takes about Cub Swanson being a good live underdog. A lot of takes with Cub Swanson having knockout upside, and things like that. Um, I have not heard yet anyone anyone um, support a take that Jonathan Martinez gets the knockout. Um, and, and 
the fact that he is only plus two to one, uh, I would expect him to, to, to get a KO or to get to finish. I would expect to see a little bit of that, but I've seen none of it. So with that said, I, I feel as though his ownership relative to his, uh, to his odds is going to be extremely low. And on a 12 fight slate, you do want to be somewhat different. I mean, significantly different. I think Martinez is actually the sneaky leverage play um, in this in this spot. So now you have Askar Askarov against Brandon Royval. And this is, uh, let's look at the pricing first. So minus 240, plus 200, you'd expect to see something like, you know, 9,100, 7,100, 9,200, 7K, something like that. Uh, let's take a look what the odds are. Uh, yeah, about that. So, so the pricing is somewhat efficient. Now we're going to look at the inside the distance prop, but there's kind of more to this fight than that. But the inside the distance prop, you have uh fight doesn't go to decision. It's about to pick them minus 120 versus minus 110. And when you break it down between fighters, you have Askarov, uh, inside the distance again, plus 200, not great. And Roy Val said this is plus 400, very similar to Cub Swanson. But the thing that, that what's different here is that Askarov has extreme grappling upside. Um, he, he goes for quite a bit of takedowns and Roy Val tends to give up quite a bit of takedowns. So Askarov does have that takedown upside that will overcome a, a lack of a good inside the distance prop. Um, so if ownership weren't a thing, I would say that Askarov is probably significantly better play than Martinez because, um, well, I should say significantly, he is a little bit more expensive, right? So that that goes against him. But the inside the distance prop is exactly the same. But he's got all that takedown upside. So so I do think that Askarov is a better play than Martinez. But as you'll see, I believe that Askarov is going to be one of the most popular fighters on the overall uh, on the whole slate. Um, given his price, given his grappling upside, given the perceived, at least, relative safety. Um, you know, listen, the case I made is a case that people can make really easily. I mean, minus 240, he's, you know, he, he minds his P's and Q's, he gets on top, he controls, good combination of safety plus upside. I mean, I think it's a obviously a really, really strong play. Uh, Brandon Roy Val, uh, I'm not going to lie, uh, I, I was actually – swayed by by a take uh on brandon roy val the guy I respect who really likes him a lot and f literally for no other reason I, I i'm gonna use him i mean he's uh he's very active he goes for a lot of submissions and while everything instinctively leads me to believe that askarov just is gonna like blanket him and not let roy val breathe and and roy val's not gonna be able to get to any of those submission attempts um, just, I, again, a couple of guys that I know that are really smart say that Roy Val's got a lot of value here. So I'm going to try it, um, just because he does have at least some degree of, of submission upside. Um, if you look at it, he is plus 380 inside the distance, which is, it's actually a little better than Cub, um, and better than, uh, than, uh, well, is better than Cub Swanson, for example. And his price is cheaper than Cub Swanson. So I think that I think that Roy Val is definitely a better underdog play than Cub Swanson, especially given where I think ownership is going to come in. I do think Cub is going to get some ownership. Um, so I, I do like both sides of this fight. Uh, Askarov is going to be the chalkier side. Roy Val is going to be probably the lower owned side, but I do like both sides of this. So just, just go uh, – or Durko, it says. I think it's just go uh, – Tudorovich versus Jordan Wright. So this is uh, one of the higher inside the distance props you'll ever see. Um, you have, well, they don't even have it here. It's like minus like 600 or something like that. Um, if you look at the inside the distance props of these guys, you have Wright inside the distance plus 200. And then you have um, Tudorovich. Where is he inside the distance? Doesn't even have them here. But but trust me, <laughs> but th this fight is 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 projected to end inside one and a half rounds, and you have to actually lay odds to even get to even play the over one and a half rounds. And that's that's pretty rare. Um, and 
it's not even close. And, and the reason why is because both of these guys just always just throw it out, throw it out. Jordan Rice specifically, I mean, I don't think he's ever gotten past like 30 seconds of the second round. Um, and Tudorovich is, is, you know, he, he gets knocked out. He knocks people out and all this stuff. So, so how do you handle a fight like this? Because everybody's going to be all over this, right? Everybody's going to see this whole thing. Everybody's going to see exactly what I just said. So there's, there's, well, there's three ways you can do it. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. The one, well, one thing you can do is try to fade it completely. It's going to be incredibly high owned. Um, and you could do that. Uh, I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't be, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't yell at you for doing that just from the standpoint of ownership, because I think that playing somebody from this fight is going to be the super obvious thing to do. Um, another way that you could play, which I think most people are actually going to play, is they're going to put like a certain amount on Tudorovic and a certain amount on Jordan Wright, usually, usually conducive to either their win odds or their price. Like you look at their price here, you have, 8,700 versus 7,500. So that kind of translates to about a, what is about a 190 favorite. Let's see if, it, let's see if there's any, any difference here in the actual, I mean, it's pretty, well, here's one thing that is somewhat different, right? So you have Tudorovic, who's actually a bigger favorite than Grasso, who's priced low and he's priced lower. He's a bigger favorite than Jonathan Martinez. He's priced about the same, right? Um, and he's got that incredible grab, you know, KO upside as well. So I think Tudorovic does have some line value here um, at this price. I think he should be more like 8,800. Ah, so it's not that much, I guess. Um, so, and that's reasonable. What, what people are probably going to do is, is, and this is, you know, I can't argue with this, is to play, say, 60% Tudorovic, 40% right, and, you know, just let the chips fall where they may. And if you do that, you're, I want to say with the field, because people aren't going, you know, 100% of the people are not going to go 100% of the fight, right? Not everybody's going to do that. There are people who are going to fade it, some people do whatever. But that is definitely of the people that know what they're doing going to be the, the, the common thing to do. But what I would probably recommend um, is something a little different. Uh, I, I, I would recommend, and this is what I'm try, trying to do a little more of, is when you have these fights where you go, I don't know who's going to win, but I'm going to take one or the other. To differentiate yourself, just just take a stand on one of them. Okay, just take a stand on one of them. Um, both of them are good plays, right? They're both good plays, but if you play both of them, you're kind of with the field for openers, and you just kind of, especially in MME, reduce the amount of combinations you can get on the on the fights that you're less sure of. You know. Uh, as far as whether either going to be in the optimal or not. So so I would actually prefer to take a side here. As for what side I would take, I honestly don't know. Um I I I think that um I think that relative to their I think relative to their prices and their chances of winning, I do think that Wright is going to be more overowned than Tudorovich. Like I think that Wright is, you know, again, the people that are playing both these guys. They're probably going to play 60-40, which means that that actually Wright is being over-owned because he probably rates to only win the fight one out of every three times. So I think that that the leverage in a really weird way here is to go is to lock in Tudorovic, for example. Um, and you know, if and then if you listen, if you really want to hedge, if you really don't like that, you know what you could do? You could go onto the DraftKings Sportsbook. Or whatever, and get a line on Jordan Wright in in the first round. So that's really the only thing you're worried about. Right? You're not really worried about, you know, Wright winning a decision. It's not happening. Okay. So if you if you can get Wright wins in round one to a plus like four hundred or something like that as kind of a hedge, um, I think you could do that. Um, I think you're better off doing that than playing kind of a popular you know, underdog and right uh, in DFS. I think so. Um, so that that's kind of my view on this fight. Obviously, all the metrics are good. You know, either fighter is a good, a good, a good, a good play. And they're both going to be pretty high owned. But I think that if you're, if you're mass building, I think you want to take a stand on one or the other. And, and you want to know the truth. I actually believe that if you play just right, 
you know, just Jordan Wright and no Tudorovic, I think that's, uh, I think that's good too. You know, um, you know, obviously that opens up all other kinds of stuff, you know, up on the top. Um, so that is the benefit of that. Um, and, you know, if you do that though, you know, just be prepared for what 67% of the time you just lose, you know, which is, Hey, that's, that's happened before. But, but if you get away with it, if you play Jordan, right. In all of your lineups or just a huge percentage of them, and he does get away with it, it's almost always going to be an incredible score. It's almost always going to be a fight that makes the optimal. And then you can just sit back and say, okay, let's see what combinations can come in that are going to be more unique than the others. So um, that's my, uh, those are my thoughts on that fight. Um, while we're at it, let's look at another fight, which rates to be pretty highly owned due to the inside the distance prop. You have Alonzo Menafield. He's minus 200 against Sirkinov. So the pricing is very similar. So I'm expecting to see the, excuse me, the, the odds are very similar. So we're expecting to see something similar as far as the pricing gap. But let's just take a look here. Why would I keep going to stands? Um, I actually have Menafield kind of a little higher price than Tudorovic, um, which is another reason why, I mean, Tudorovic is kind of an elite play at that price. You know what I mean? Um, and is that going to translate to higher ownership? Yeah, probably. But it's not going to be higher owned than 100%, which is what I might recommend you playing him, you know, if you're going to mass build. So... Uh, so Metafield looks like, you know, he's, there, this 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 seems to be priced somewhat efficiently. Um, let's look at the inside the distance prop here. And as you'll see, it's extremely strong. Fight doesn't go to decision is minus 360. If it were not for this Jordan Wright fight, this would clearly be the fight that everybody would, would attack 100%. And it's very possible that people do that anyway. You know, like if you were going to build like a lineup and, and, you know, I would say, hey, what's your first lineup? Or how would you approach this? The first thing I would do is I would take somebody from the um, from this fight, right? Um, excuse me, somebody from the the Tudorovic right fight, and somebody from the Menafield Sirkinov fight. And what you would do, let's say you want to play multiple entries, you play all combinations of those four fighters, right? And so you end up with what was it? Six combinations, four combinations. My, my brain is fried right now. But you played Tudorovic with Menafield, Tudorovic with Sirkinov, right with Menafield, right with Sirkinov. So four, four lineups to start off with. Okay. And you go a hundred percent on, on this, these two, you know, these two fights and certainly makes sense. I mean, with that type of inside the distance prop, um, that's, that's kind of what, you, what you're looking for as far as good, you know, as good GPP, good GPP plays. Um, let's break it down a little bit by where it's coming from. So you have Menafield, who is basically uh, he's, he's a pick em inside the distance and that's strong, you know, like, Compared to those other 9K fighters we talked about who were minus, you know, plus 200, this, you know, pick them inside the distance is tough. You know, that, that's really, really strong um, at 8,800. And then you have, and then you have a uh, circuit off inside the distance plus 250, which is, it's just not bad. You know, look, it's, it's a hell of a lot better than, than um, what's his name? Than uh, uh, Cub Swanson at a similar price, right? All the other 7K fighters I talked about were all like plus 400, right? Inside the distance. So his inside the distance prop is extremely strong, not to mention the fact that he's got takedown upside, okay? So Serkinov is an extremely, extremely strong play, okay? Um, so uh, for all those reasons, I do think both these fighters are just incredible GPP plays. Don't know exactly which one I prefer. Um, I would just, again, say that you should probably play well, so if you're following my advice and you want to play four lineups, um, you could either, again, pick one of these guys and go all in, right? Or go kind of 60-40 or something like that. And I, I just totally support either either approach, but I definitely think you need to take at least somebody from this one. Uh, okay. Um, Brandon Davis against Mana Martinez. Again, let's first take a look at the odds. Uh, make sure there's no sneaky line value we didn't didn't know about. So she's my so he's minus one sixty. So I imagine he's going to be something like eighty six hundred or maybe eighty seven hundred, and it would be only eighty five hundred. All right. So Mana Martinez actually has a little bit of line value here. Um, not through the roof, but 
definitely, you know, is that worth noting? Yeah, I think that that's worth noting. A little bit of line value there. Um, let's take a look at the inside the distance props here. You have fight doesn't go to decision about pick them. I mean, not great. And then if we break this down, you have Martinez wins inside the distance is plus 180. Plus 180 is not great at uh, certainly at the 9K level. But at the 8,600, it's it's fair. You know, it's not the best, but it's certainly fair. I definitely regard the Martinez side as kind of a, you know, a secondary GPP type play. Um, problem is that I've heard a lot of Mana Martinez talking content this week. So it's possible that he's going to be a little bit higher owned than he maybe should be. Uh, let's take a look at the Davis side. Davis inside the distance plus 350. Now, again, we're still talking about the similar inside the distance prop to other guys that, you know, uh, whatchamacallit. Uh, well, he's to other guys who are cheaper, right? So so I'm, I'm not interested in the Brandon Davis side of this year. I might as well go play, you know, Cub Swanson at 7,400. Um, uh, then play Brandon Davis at 7,700. We already determined that I don't even, you know, Club Swanson might be, you know, even worse than, than say, Roy Val at 7K, you know. So um, I'd rather play like a, a Brandon Roy Val than, say, a Brandon Davis. The only thing I would say is that Brandon Davis might be low owned. So you do have that going for you. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, I think this fight is overall kind of a secondary uh, fight to attack it's not something that you really need and but if you do play like 150 you're going to get to this and that certainly is okay also so now we have the fight that was added you have joe anderson brito uh against replacement fighter lucas alexander and i've seen these before and this is just you know this is just something you have to play i mean you have a guy coming in short notice against a knockout artist and and, and the odds don't lie here he's he's a minus 400 and they priced him at 9,400. Um, pretty reasonable, I think. You look at the inside the distance prop here. Let's take a look at it. You have Brito win specifically by TKO plus 120, by plus 250 uh, by submission. Inside the, for him to win inside the distance is minus 165. Now that's really strong. You know, as a matter of fact, Brito wins in round one is plus 130. I mean, these these types of metrics are very, very difficult to fade. The, the only reason you'd fade them is because it would, if it would make your lineups a little bit too hard or if they're, the ownership went through the roof. I think what you have to hope for on the Brito side, because I do think it's a pretty elite play given those numbers, you have to hope that because he didn't wasn't added to the slate until Thursday, he won't be as, as highly uh, analyzed. But unfortunately, that's not the case because the content has been has been talking about this fight. They haven't been talking about it from the respect of DFS for a while, but I do. I don't think you're going to get any break on this fight, but I think it's a tough one to fade. Um, uh, so, and, and and I don't like the Lucas Alexander side at all. So for me, it's going to be Brito if I can get to him, and I should be able to, um, or nothing. Okay, Victor Henry versus uh, Asun Asuncio, uh, another minus four hundred. Um, and this one though. You look at the pricing, it's about, you know, it's pretty same. It's pretty much the same as the, uh, as the, uh, uh, Rodriguez, who are we talking about as Brito? It's pretty much the same 9,400 versus 9,300. So let's take a look at the inside the distance prop on that one. Um, Victor Henry. See, this is much worse, right? This fight doesn't go to decision line. It's minus only 125. And then you have Henry winning by TKO plus 150. Well, hold on. Let's take a look here. Henry inside the distance is minus one, minus 130. I mean, that's not bad, right? Compare that to, say, Brito. His inside the distance is minus 165. So it's, it's close. I don't think this is that bad. So I actually do think that that Henry is almost maybe almost as good a play as Brito. I wasn't expecting that because Henry, listen, Henry was a four to one underdog in his last fight. Um, and he doesn't really fit the profile of the guy that's all kinds of KO upside. But 
you know, he is fighting a guy who's older. And one thing I've, I've noticed also about these kind of older fighters that might be at the end of their careers is they, they kind of, they tend to give up a little faster than the younger guys who are still fighting for future fights. So I do think that there is, there's definitely a tail upside in the Henry side here. So I'm definitely going to include that as kind of one of my top plays. Um, and I don't, I do think that Henry's going to be lower owned than, than Brito. Um, and well, certainly going to be lower owned than the, the Jorovich and all that stuff. So, uh, and I'm not going to get to any Asuncio as, as a dog here. So this next fight kind of gives me a headache. All right. Um, Maximoff versus Malkoon. You have, you have Maximoff is about a 130 favorite, um, which probably get him about maybe the 8,300 price tag. And that's exactly what he gets. 8,300 versus 7,900. There's going to be a very poor inside the distance prop here because, um, you know, Let's look at it. Fight doesn't go to decision. It's like it's 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 a big favorite to, to go to decision. The reason why is because the UFC decided they were going to be be wise guys and just pair two stone singular wrestlers. I want to say they're stone. That's but stone. I was going to say stone cold wrestlers. Not stone. Stone cold wrestlers up against one another. What they usually do is they make it somewhat interesting. They put a wrestler versus, you know, striker, a grappler versus striker. But here they're putting two total wrestlers up against one another. Don't understand that quite much, quite a lot. And this is not really good for the UFC brand. I mean, the whole idea of mixed martial arts is to see different types of fighters, whatever. Anyway, um, so what happens is you have two guys that in and of themselves have a, have, have good – scoring upside as far as the grappling goes but 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 you know, listen if, you, if the guy gets a lot of takedowns he's going to score well in decisions even but the problem is is when both guys are expert at that at that field um sometimes they just they just can't assert enough dominance you know like like i i could see a i could see a result where each of these guys gets a couple of takedowns but nobody really dominates the fight so so then they made a harder i say harder because it's almost a pick and fight the, the the pricing is such that you don't really need that much right um i don't need a hundred i think out of these guys to get them um it would be nice but you don't really need a hundred so the question is are these guys going to get there in a decision in a competitive wrestling match boy i, I tend to think no but but there's there's another way to look at fights like this which which i remember from ricky simone was fighting someone and the two of them had both had you know it was gonna they both had a lot of wrestling upside and when one guy just it turns out is just better than the other guy than we thought it could end up being a total domination right you think about it if both guys are just wrestlers and it turns out that one guy is just a, that much better than the other guy that means the other guy has no answer you know what I mean? The other guy has no other style to go to. So it is possible that one of these guys is just better than the other one and then can rack up all those points. So I honestly don't know what to do with this. What I'm probably going to do is kind of whip out and, and, and pretty much go with the field, which probably means something like, like 33% fade, 33% Malcoon. 33% maximum. I'm going to, you know, it's very little value added in that analysis, in that approach, but I just really don't know what to make of it. Um, I, I want 33% of each guy just in case, right? Because if you, if you, if you, if, if that, if, if, if um, scenario C is correct and one guy dominates the other and the other guy has no answers, that's, you, you just lose if you don't have that guy, you know? That's the way you get 100 points. Uh, and if you don't have a 100-point guy at 8,300, that's that's tough. Um, but the fade works too, you know. I've seen this situation where they end up kind of like doing some awful striking or worse, like maybe like one guy gets a takedown one round and the other guy gets a takedown the second round. Or or even like they keep they alternate takedowns a little bit. And then the, the, the winner in the decision that's like 75 or 80, you know what I mean? So I could see this going a lot of different ways, and I just honestly don't know what to do with it. Sam Hughes versus Pierre Rodriguez. Take a look at this one. Uh, as far as pricing goes, you have Rodriguez at minus 160 or 170. So 
expecting something like, was it 8,700, 75, something like that. Maybe 8,775, let's take a look. And you have, yeah, 8,676, pretty much the same. Um, the inside the distance prop is going to be poor here. Uh, it's probably going to be two to one to finish at least, right? Yeah, minus 280 to finish. So you typically don't want to fight like this. The only thing that I would say is that Sam Hughes, it's possible that Sam Hughes has wrestling upside. Okay. The reason why I say it's possible is, is I mean, I've listened to the content, I've listened to the analysis, and I've heard varying accounts. Like I've heard that that she's just since she moved to the new gym, something has clicked and she's just better and she's gonna be more aggressive. Um, the other thing I've heard is that the the, the fights where she started to go to her grappling have been just cupcake grapplers. You know what I mean? Like grapplers that really couldn't do anything. Um, so I think that this fight is probably going to end up being a pass. For me. Either a pass or maybe a small sprinkle of, of, of Sam Hughes. Um, if Sam Hughes were going to be really popular, I would say just blindly take, you know, Rodriguez as, as kind of leverage. But but I don't think I want to do that. I think I think that I'll play a little bit of Hughes just in case, you know what I mean? But, but I don't, I'm not going to make her a priority. And Rodriguez again is uh, I'm probably not going to get to. Uh, last two fights, you have Tatsu Tiara versus C.H. Vergara. You have a minus 250. So a minus 250, you know, is probably going to look like um, a 9,200-ish or something like that. 91, probably 9,100, 9,200. Take a look and see what that is. Uh, that is correct. 9,100, 7,100 right on the nose. Let's take a look at the inside the distance prop here. You have you have fight doesn't go to decision. It's it's not the greatest. You know, it's minus 175. Um, that's not really good. And let's let's see how it breaks down. You have well, first you have Vergara inside the distance plus 500. And that's worse than some of the other guys we mentioned. So he's out, at least for me. Tiara inside the distance is plus 240, and that's kind of poor, you know. The only thing that is pushing him closer to the top is this grappling upside he has. Um, and, and, and the problem with this is that um, from what I have heard, like content wise or whatever, he's not exactly like that offensive wrestler type of grappler. He's more of someone that could maybe clinch a little bit and then maybe take your back against the cage. And, and, and he is 20, only 22. Whenever a 22 year old guy has to go grapple against, you know, kind of a, a more, developed uh young man like a 29 year old 30 year old sometimes bites off a little more than he can chew with respect to how much chew with respect to how much strength he has so it's um i actually am more down on this spot than i was at the beginning of the week i really thought that tiara was going to be a really top play for me because of the grappling upside but i just i just think if i'm going to do that i'm just going to probably end up going to um to ask her off um, I just feel as though the Tiara and, and Vergara is, 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 he's been around the block. He's got to throw some volume. He gets after it. I think at 9,100, I just don't feel as though I have the same degree of safety, not so much from the win because the odds are what they are, but safety with respect to his upside. You know, I just don't, I'm just not a hundred percent convinced that this is where this fight's going to go. So I do, you know, look, he, he's, he, he's okay. And sure, he can take him, take his back in the first round and submit him and gets 100 or whatever. Um, but I think that his price is is makes him kind of a poor to fair play. That's the best I can hedge on that one. And Vergara, I, I'd like to play him, but it just is, you know, the inside the distance prop is not good enough. And and I just I just want finishing upside from these underdogs in this particular slate. And you have Mike Jackson against Pete Rodriguez. Now you have a plus five, a minus 500, excuse me, minus 700. So what do you do with a minus 700 guy? What do you price him at? I mean, probably like 9,500 or something. I think that's what they did, right? They got him at 9,500. Yeah, he's 9,500. And then you look at the inside the distance prop here. I mean, listen, for a 9,500 guy, he's got to have either, you know, a insane inside the distance prop or or grappling ground and pound upside or both. 
uh, let's just take a look at it. We have an inside the distance prop. Well, it's minus 700 to not go to decision. Ouch. Um, boy, I thought that Tudorovich line was, 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 was interesting. And then the funniest thing is that it's probably all on this one guy. Yeah, I mean, you have Rodriguez inside the distance, minus 360. I mean, that's tough to fade, right? That's just ridiculous. I mean, you think about it, compare that to like, to who is 9,400? Like Brito? I mean, you have Brito's, first of all, is twice as less likely to win. And, and the other thing is that you have Brito inside the distance is, let's look at it again. Brito inside of this is minus 165. I mean, that's like so much worse. And and it's only an extra 100 bucks, you know? So, boy, it kind of stinks to play these types of fighters, but the numbers are just so strong. And then you have, let's see what his odds of knocking out in the first round. That's really what you need, right? Um, Rodriguez in the first round is, where is this? is okay it's minus 190 in round one are you kidding so 67 percent of the time he scores 100 points i mean you just have i think you just have to play this and figure out the rest you know these numbers are just too strong and, and the sick thing is i have heard some takes that jackson is live um jackson in his last fight which was supposed to be exactly like this he ended up uh, the guy was fighting ended up being like awful and they ended up like clinching and the other guy like poked him in the eye and they had a nose contest. And that's certainly in play this week. But I mean, the guy that, that he's fighting here, Rodriguez, I mean, he has like a whole bunch of first round KOs. I just think that these numbers, I just kind of overcome all that. And I just got to hope that all the narrative about what happened last time Jackson fought and the, and, and the small little takes I'm seeing on Jackson maybe keeps Rodriguez's ownership low. I mean, perchance to dream, I guess, but. I mean, you just kind of have to play this. That's the bottom line. And I'm not playing Jackson the plus 600. So not, not, not for me. Um, so overall, I mean, let's just kind of review here. I mean, we, we kind of went from the top down. And I think it was, it was kind of easy to identify the underdogs that were kind of in play here. Just to kind of review them. I, I think Arahu at 7,300, 7,100, completely in play. I think Swanson is in play, but I think he's going to be a little too high owned. I think, I think Roy Val is probably a better underdog play than, than Swanson for that reason. Jordan Wright is obviously kind of a smash underdog play. Serkin off is a smash underdog play. Um, so you have those to kind of choose from here. I mean, you're kind of in business, you know, like you can get to these, to these $9,500 fighters with, with kind of ease. If you, if you could play, you know, several of those underdogs together, um, and again, if you want kind of the hoodoo play, I think that's going to be the low owned play that might fall uh, by the wayside is a, an admittedly bad projection, but whatever, of Jonathan Martinez. Because I think that he, and listen, I tried this the other week and it didn't work out. I had the same take on, on Andre Feely. I thought Feely was going to be a smash play, smash play. I thought he was a great leverage play off of all that other stuff at the same price range. He ended up just getting a decision, so that didn't help me. But I think that Martinez is inside the distance prop. Again, let's take a look at what's a plus 200. Um, uh, plus 225 KO um, inside the distance completely is it's plus 200. So it's not the greatest, but 33% of the time he gets a finish, you know, and, and no one's going to play him. I don't say nobody, but I don't know. I think if people pile on the Askarov, look, if you get Roy Val home, all right, you 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 deal with the Askarov stuff. And then if you could then have a kind of a, an extra bit of leverage in Martinez, um, and let's just say that you played right and didn't play Tudorovich in that lineup, you know, you you have Martinez as the same price as Tudorovich, and then if you get that parlay of right and Roy Val, I mean, let's go. You know, that then, then then you play the Martinez, you could play. The, the 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 Rodriguez, you know, and then you're then you're in business. I think that these mid-range fights like the Malcoons and the Maximovs and the and the and the um the Mana Martinez is even, you know, I think I think those fights are not going to be particularly interesting to me. Um and the main event, I don't 
you know, with the exception of Arahu, I don't think I'm playing a share of that play. Um, meaning that I'm not playing any of Grasso. All right. Uh, I think it's going to be a fun, fun card. Um, uh, hope you guys uh, are in contention and take it down.